thanks to all of our speakers um, for joining us today and, and sharing um, those presentations. I think we all got a lot lot out of them. So we're, we're ready to start in, um, answering some questions. I think I'll go ahead and start maybe. Um, you, at least Dr. Nidem and Dr. Brown Brandle both touched a little bit on uh, the challenges for workers, you know, of um, the, the need for simplicity of either the technology or the SOPs. And then, um, Tammy, you also talked about how we have a lot of turnover in the workforce um, in in some of those spaces. And I'm wondering how those two things kind of, um, in your observation, um, I guess, feed off each other in terms of uh, the your ability to train people on the farms to do something like an on-farm culturing or to use these technologies um, when you have such high turnover. Um, has that been a problem in in uh, um, application to this point or um, or no? Either one of you can. <laughs> um, so. I guess I'll jump in. Um, so right now we are we're starting to apply stuff in the swine area. Um, I think producers and animal caretakers are are latching on to that fairly quickly. We we will see more technology coming on coming on. I think I think it's going to do a, a different thing is we're changing the job of a person. Like if we go from um, and Daryl, you can you can help me out on this. But if we go from a rotary parlor system into a robotic milking system, that's a different skill set that we need. And I, to me, I think that becomes maybe more exciting to to our young people to to work with robots and animals, and not just not just manual labor, feeding feeding animals, milking cows. Yeah, agreed. There's a lot of interesting opportunities as we go forward. Um, Tammy took the example of a rotary and robots. I actually think the future of milking cows is robots on the rotary. Um, I think that's in the big picture where we're going to go for, for at least large dairies. That's a little bit of a sidelight. But those things take technology and they take people who can work with that technology to get it done. However, for some of the animal health and antimicrobial things we want to support, we still have to have distilled that information that can come out of those systems because there's so many bells and whistles and gadgets and gizmos in, for example, robotic milking, that it's, it's just data overload. And there's another whole job there for people to work with that data and distill it down into actionable items. So I think there's lots of fun opportunity to be involved in sophisticated animal source food production. Fun, fun times ahead. Agreed. Uh, one question uh, for Dr. Loy, when you're talking about um, uh, the changes that you guys have been making within the Diagnostic Center, um, I wonder if you have any data for uh, how that's changed prescribing practices with your clients in terms of uh, general numbers of, of reduced uh, use or more targeted use or something like that. Yeah, I, I will say that, you know, the industry as a whole doesn't have a lot of great data on use. It's more um, the the at least at an individual level. I will say that, you know, uh, Dr. Nida mentioned, you know, some regulatory changes that have been occurring uh, across the animal health space related to antibiotics. And one of these has been the implementation of veterinary feed directives, um, which have, have reduced, you know, by almost half, 30% to 40%, the, the total amount of antibiotics fed to, or the total amount of antibiotics used in animals. Um, so since 2017, we are using the least amount of antibiotics we've used, you know, in, in, in decades, um, j just because of that. Uh, and, and I think part of this is, uh, you know, because of those veterinary feed directives, you know, now we now have removed some of these drugs um, that were available kind of over the counter um, through, you know, a tractor supply or whatever. 
Uh, you know, those now require prescription. And I think now that that a lot of those com- more conversations are being had between producers and their veterinarians and their animal health staff, uh, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity to leverage more of this technology to really kind of narrow down drug selection. Um, I think where we've seen it is is we uh, we have producers that don't get the response that they may like. They have a protocol set up that says we use this drug to treat this uh, this respiratory dis- type of respiratory disease case. Where we've used that is we've gone in and done, done some diagnostics and shown resistance to some of those first line drugs they were using. Then they were able to alter their therapy and, and I think really have a more effective first line drug rather than having to retreat animals, use more antibiotics and select for more resistance. They're really able to choose that drug that's really the most impactful in their animals. Um, so they're not having to retreat. I, I don't have any hard data on it, but I, I will say um, the industry as a whole is using much less antibiotics um, uh, uh, in, in, in general. And we're still uh, making plenty of uh, cheese and beef, right? And, and pork, sorry. That, that's right, yep. <laughs> yeah, even beyond the feed directive uh, this summer, not even injectables can be over the counter anymore. You, um, unless it's still in stock, you can't go down and pick up a bottle of uh, Oxytet or penicillin anymore, right? It's all gonna be scripted going forward. Do you, this is a little off topic, but have you guys uh, got a sense that those changes are sort of widely known or acknowledged outside of like the caretakers themselves or is it, um, I mean, because I think uh, people are concerned about the the idea of antibiotics in the food, although as Daryl was um, presenting, that's, that's a pretty low risk, but um, the use could select for resistance. Um, but I don't know that um, people are very aware of, of these changes and how that's affecting the level of resistance or the level of antibiotic use in food production. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree. I think we do a poor job of, of making that well known, but it's, it's certainly, it's, it's really, um, uh, you know, kind of what Dr. Nidem showed, everything is we, we're, we have the healthiest animals we've ever had. We're using less antibiotics than we had. Um, and, and really it's a, it's a big success story. And I think as we continue to push more towards uh, stewardship and even more disease prevention, like Dr. Brown Brandles talked about, is can we identify those quickly and maybe prevent uh, um, disease outbreaks from occurring? I, I think we just do. We we've not done a good enough job, at kind of kind of telling our story about the successes that there's been, and I think they'll continue to be as as we we go forward. Agreed. I think this is a great success story to tell, and we don't tell it very well. The average person, well-educated, well-intended that I meet on the street, still thinks that at least dairy cows are full of antibiotics, and it's actually impossible. We, we couldn't sell sell milk, and, and it's just not known. Well, that seems like uh, I still I don't see any questions from the audience, so um, that seems like a good message to end on. Um, that you know, there's you guys are are working within spaces to help continuing to improve um, and target the use of antimicrobials in livestock production um, to sick animals and specific um, microbes. So um, the work will continue, but progress has already been. Um, Great. So again, I'm going to thank our speakers and our audience for joining us. And as you're logging off, remind everybody to please take that survey uh, to give us some feedback on, on, this, um, on this webinar. So thank you, everyone, very much.